In this discussion, we're going to look at different types of neurological drugs and some of the pathologies that they treat. We're going to focus on a select um, couple pathologies that we're going to look at. A lot of the drugs that are used to treat these pathologies are also used for other conditions, so it's important to keep that in mind. This talk does not have a corresponding chapter in your textbook, so really make sure you're paying very close attention taking notes on a lot of the sections to make sure that you have uh, all of your information that you need. But as I said, we're going to be looking at some of the different neurological drugs, and as I said, some of the more common pathologies that are there used to treat. So we're first going to look at medications used to treat seizures. Um, but first we're going to talk a little bit about seizures and, and how they occur. So seizures are, an, are caused by an abnormal discharge of neurons in the brain. The, the condition that where a person has chronic seizures is epilepsy. So you could certainly have a seizure without having epilepsy, but epilepsy is the, the condition that we associate with an individual that has chronic seizures. In looking at the different types of seizures, your two broad categories of seizures, you have partial seizures and you have generalized seizures. Your partial seizures are called that because they only deal with one part of the brain. So when someone has a partial seizure, the abnormal discharges are kind of focal to one area of the brain, whereas with generalized seizures, it's more, um, more spread out throughout the brain. Your partial seizures are broken down into simple and complex. Your, and when someone has a simple partial seizure, they retain consciousness. When they have a complex partial seizure, they go unconscious. Your types of generalized seizures, you have absence, myoclonic, and tonic-clonic. Your absence seizures are seizures where the individual essentially just kind of loses con um, consciousness and usually what's typically seen with this, with individuals that have absent seizures, they sort of just kind of stare out into space um, and, and that's usually what happens. They're usually very short, they last less than 30 seconds. So that's, you know, if you see somebody that has, you know, a seizure problem and it looks like they're kind of just staring and not responding, they're, they're likely experiencing an, an absence seizure. A myoclonic seizure involves brief contractions of the muscles. And then your tonic-clonic seizure is, I would say typically what people think of major seizure, seizures is what most people think of with the tonic-clonic seizure. The individual goes unconscious and they go through basically sustained cycles of muscle contraction and relaxation. So the, the, the sustained contractions represent the tonic aspect of it and then the alternating periods of relaxation deals with the clonus or the, or the clonic portion of the, of the tonic-clonic seizure. So looking at your different anti-epileptic medications, something to keep in mind is the fact that a lot of these medications are used to treat other disorders. So don't assume that because you see one of these medications that the person has epilepsy. They may have some other type of condition. So you know, as you're going through your health histories and you see this, you know, make sure you confirm why, why they're actually taking the medication. So in looking at some of these medications, um, first of all, the brand name will be the name in parentheses, so be able to recognize what the, the brand name versus the generic name is. So phenobarbital, which was one of the, the first widely used anti-seizure medications, it is relatively inexpensive and relatively low in toxicity. Um, it inhibits seizures through the action of the GABA receptors. So GABA is short for GABA aminobutric acid, and it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it, it actually helps to uh, limit the seizure activity through that action. Your uh, phenytoin and your carbamazepine are both work through your sodium channels. So what, what essentially happens, both of these drugs um, kind of slow the rate of recovery after activation in the, the central nervous system through the sodium channels. So that's kind of their mechanism of action as far as how both of those drugs work. 
Ethosuximide is a drug that works on the calcium channels. So in the thalamus, uh, the neurons in the, in the thalamus are where the, this drug works. It basically works on those calcium currents in that region. Valproic acid works on the calcium channels as well and also on the GABA receptors. And there's also, the valproic acid also has a similar mechanism of action that you, we saw in some of the other drugs on the sodium channels as well. So uh, phenytoin and carbamazepine, as we talked about before, work on the sodium channels and we, there, there's also the, the aspect of val, the valproic acid that also works on them in addition to the calcium channels and GABA. Uh, gabapentin is a GABA agonist which is used uh, typically with some other medications, particularly for those who are very difficult to treat epilepsy. And in many other cases, for other pathologies, gabapentin is also used in treating migraines and other types of chronic pain, particularly people who have um, nerve-based pain. Um, they, they, they tend to use gabapentin in, in treating those conditions as well. Uh, Lamotrigine is another drug that also works on the sodium channels per some of the other uh, drugs we talked about. Topiramate, and brand name Topamax, is another anti-epileptic medication. Various effects on the central nervous system, particularly with the sodium channel currents, that's kind of the main mechanism of action is, is working on, again, on the, the, the sodium channel currents. Um, this is a lot of times indicated as a second agent, um, usually in people who have partial seizures who don't respond to their initial treatment. As far as the adverse reactions, we're just going to look at them as a group. Um, some of the different types of medications that we talk about, they have specific um, adverse reactions. So we're looking at this more large group as opposed to breaking it down per medication. So just know and understand what the adverse reactions of epilep anti-epileptic medications on the whole is. So in other words, you know, groups of these adverse reactions are typically associated only with one of the drugs that we talked about. But like I said, it's just going to be, I think it's just more practical for us to know what they are as a group. Um, so again, they're all listed up here, sedation, balance issues, behavior changes, drowsiness, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, skin rashes, aplastic anemia, GI problems, vertigo. Steven Johnson syndrome um, is probably the one thing on here you haven't uh, learned about. Steven Johnson syndrome is actually a life-threatening skin condition. It causes the, the epidermis to actually separate from the dermis. So that's definitely something that you, you'd want to be aware of. And then liver toxicity. Some of these medications actually require people to regularly go and get blood work um, to make sure that their liver isn't being affected from, from utilizing them. Another group of drugs we're going to look at are antidepressant drugs. Um, just a little background on depression. You know, as far as your population, it is much more common in women. Your major depression signs and symptoms, intense sadness, loss of interest in activities, poor appetite, sleep issues, psychomotor agitation, decreased libido, decreased self-worth, decreased concentration, thoughts of suicide. And usually what we look at, there, there's a specific time frame that these issues are kind of associated with. I mean, I think it, at some point, most people, you know, due to a major life event, stress, whatever, ha you know, what have you, certainly have some of these feelings at times, but obviously if they're prolonged, or again, as you look at the more serious signs and symptoms, obviously, you know, thoughts of death and suicide are, are certainly things that render an intervention um, in, in, this, in this respect. Most of the time what we're dealing with when we're talking major clinical depression is a problem in the neurotransmitter actions and in the drugs that we're going to look at are drugs that affect the, these actions of the neurotransmitters. So particularly those involving serotonin and, and norepinephrine are the neurotransmitters that um, that these drugs are going to affect. Your tricyclic antidepressants block the reuptake 
of serotonin and norepinephrine. So again, one of the, the proposed causes of, of clinical depression involve the neurotransmitter chemicals and particularly decreased amounts of them. So by blocking the reuptake, you have a, a larger amount of those um, chemical neurotransmitters present. The ex some examples of some brand name examples of tricyclic antidepressants that get utilized are Elevil and Tofranil are some of your, your common tricyclic antidepressants. So these again, basically end up blocking the reuptake of those, those two neurotransmitters. The other class of antidepressant drugs are your selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or they'll call them SSRIs. These allow, again, we, we look at the, the actions of serotonin and norepinephrine. Specific to these, they allow for serotonin to be utilized more effectively. Uh, the, the idea here in the development of these, they're not more effective than tricyclic antidepressants. The idea is they, they have fewer side effects. So that's where the benefit maybe comes into someone using an SSRI. Your more common selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, I, I listed the, the, certainly not all of them, but Prozac, Paxil, and Zoloft, again, these are, these are name brands of these, of these drugs, are your more common SSRIs. So here's just something to kind of uh, give you a visual as far as um, basically the, the pathology behind clinical depression and how the medications work. So if you, if you follow the, the illustration here, you have an individual without depression and you can see the, the, the neurons and the synapse. So the synapse is the space between the neurons and you can see the circulating levels of ser serotonin, that neurotransmitter, and also the serotonin receptors. Now, if you go to the middle picture, you see the individual with, with depression. They have decreased levels of the neurotransmitter serotonin. The depressed treated individual, so this could be an individual who is treated with a um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, where the, the medication blocks the reuptake of serotonin. So if you look in the synapse, you can see, and I have it illustrated on the picture, where those, where the medication actually works to block the, the reuptake of the serotonin, which is going to allow for a more effective use and increased amounts of the neurotransmitter to be present in the synapse. Looking at your side effects, um, your tricyclic antidepressants, you have anticholinergic side effects. You also have side effects, um, uh, weight loss, constipation, diarrhea, and heartburn. Your selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, primarily gastrointestinal dysfunction and sexual dysfunction. Both types can cause an increased risk of suicide. So again, this is one of those situations where you know, increased risk of suicide is a sign and symptom of depression. So for something that it treats, it could actually make a symptom or an issue associated with it worse. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, we're gonna look at some of the medications here. Most of the prescribed medications are stimulants that are derived from amphetamines. So when we look at some of the common characteristics of this, this disorder that we see, poor concentration, distractibility, hyperactivity, impulsiveness inappropriate with a person's age and maturity level. Now it's, it's interesting to think that you sit there and think, well, based on those descriptors of the disorder, why would you prescribe a stimulant? It's actually a pretty complicated um, description as far as how the, the pharmacology works here. But essentially what prescribing a stimulant does is it actually suppresses the, interestingly enough, the hyperactive behavior associated with ADHD and it tends to stimulate the um, other behavioral um, things that are actually suppressed when somebody has ADHD. So 
you would think, well, geez, if you give someone a stimulant that already has this, it's going to cause them to get worse. It doesn't. It's actually very effective in suppressing that behavior and then some of the other um, behavior patterns associated with the neurologic activity of the brain tends to get better. So things like improved learning and memory skills, those things, um, if you will, for lack of a better way of put it, get stimulated, whereas the, the hyperactivity and the impulsiveness actually get suppressed with the use of the uh, amphetamine. So in looking at the pharmacodynamics of these stimulant drugs, they act at norepinephrine receptors, um, so they're, they're related to those, those neurotransmitters. They basically cause an increase in the release of the excitatory neurotransmitters, particularly dopamine and norepinephrine, and they then prevent the reuptake of those particular neurotransmitters. Um, this is a drug that, that can obviously cross the blood-brain barrier. So we, we talked about the, the blood-brain barrier earlier on in the semester and the significance of that. Um, again, for this drug to be effective um, where it needs to work, it has to be able to do that. Some of your common types of stimulant-based ADH drugs are listed here. Your Adderall, Ritalin, Concerta, and Dexedrin are some of the more uh, common drugs associated with um, ADHD. So primarily we look at stimulant-based ADHD medications. Um, there are non-stimulant versions as well. Uh, Stratera, uh, which is the brand name here, is is a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, so it is a non-stimulant-based ADHD drug. Uh, the benefit to this type of medication is that it's not banned by the um, NCAA or by the World Anti-Doping Agency. So it, it makes it much easier to be utilized for these athletes. They don't have to worry about getting exemptions or possibly getting um, a positive drug test from them. And here we have our side effects. So your stimulant medications in particular could cause hypertension, lack of sleep, decreased appetite. Those would be common things that we would associate with, with any type of stimulant medication. Um, your Stratera, um, again, is a non-stimulant medication. Typically what you see with that is an increase in drowsiness and also GI dysfunction are side effects associated with those medications. So just some thought questions associated with the use of neurological drugs. Um, we're, we're not doing discussion posts for this, this section. So just some things to think about and, and, you know, for your own purposes. So think about individuals, you know, what, what, is, what is the status as far as participation in sports with seizure disorders? Um, seizure disorders are not contraindicated for most sporting activities. Um, right now, just offhand, I believe motorsports um, is really the only sport where a seizure disorder would disqualify somebody. Um, you know, contact collision sports, you know, there, there's no contraindication there. And it's actually found that participation in physical activity is very beneficial for people with seizure disorders. So, again, it's just important to know your management of these individuals and just be aware of the side effects associated with the medications. Um, as far as the issues associated with ADHD medication use in sports participation, you have to look at um, the, the guidelines in as far as what needs to be documented in their medical file. So, for instance, in the, the NCAA, and, and we're going to talk about rules and, and, and regulations later on, um, it's one of the last topics we discuss, but for instance, participation in the NCAA um, there, there needs to be a certain procedure and certain things need to be documented. You can't, and it's not as simple as just having a prescription by the physician. There has to be um, full documentation of, of why the individual needs to be on um, a stimulant-based ADHD medication. Obviously, if they're using a non-stimulant, 
based medication um, such as Stratera that, that's not a concern. So you need to make sure that you're aware of those issues if you have an athlete who um, either who needs to have who needs to take that type of drug. And these are your learning outcomes here. So um, again, understand, you know, again, basic pathology that we talked about with the disorders. We didn't get really in depth, but you know, some of the things that we discussed, obviously you're gonna be responsible for knowing. Um, understand the mechanism of action of the drugs, be able to recognize what type of drugs fall in the different categories, recognize brand name and, and, and the generic name of the individual drugs and the, the side effects associated with them. And just in general, be aware of some of the, the points that we had brought up in as far as um, participation while taking certain drugs, particularly the, the stimulant-based um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder medications.